So we are going to start by looking into the area of parallel communications first because in some ways it's easier to sort of motivate the idea behind parallel communication hopefully understand why parallel communication is difficult and then sort of discuss why serial communication protocols are much more popular today. The idea behind parallel communication is simple. You have two devices that want to communicate with each other. Now, one thing that once again I want to repeat, I have mentioned this earlier, the terminology master-slave is very common in the context of communication systems in general, but any kind of control technology. Now, master-slave is also a loaded term politically and especially it is not a very popular term to use because it has negative connotations. However, most of the terminology that you come across, most of the literature still uses this. So, we are using it purely in the context of the technology that we have over here. And the reason why it is being used this way is that we want to convey the idea that there is one master device that controls the entire use of the uh, communication channel or the protocol or initiates transfers and the slave device or the secondary device as it is sometimes called does not initiate transfers. It basically participates in the communication but always waits for the master to initiate any activity. So we will be using these terms as we move forward and the only thing that you need to remember is when some device is called a master it means it is capable of initiating a transaction or a transfer of communication of data. Right? Whereas the slave devices are mostly passive to start with meaning that if they are just connected and there is no communication with them they are not going to respond until some master it may there may be more than one master in the communication system initiates a transaction with this particular slave device. Okay, So if I have one master device and a slave device and I want to transfer data between them right what I could do, right, I could think of the kind of wires that I need for that. The first of course is I would need a bunch of wires for transferring data because let's say that I want to transfer bytes of data. I would basically need eight parallel wires between these two. Now in this case I've just shown four but yeah ideally if you are dealing with data which is already in the let's say ASCII coded level then you your sort of basic unit of communication or basic unit of data is a byte. And it probably makes sense to have eight wires between these two. Now keep in mind that these are electrical circuits. So a wire, even though it is shown as a single arrow over here, always requires another return path. So all of this is under the assumption that there is some kind of common electrical path between these two. Right? So that sort of goes implicitly. It is a factor that many people from who are purely dealing with the computer programming aspects of things tend to forget after a while, right? But when you are building an embedded system, you can never lose sight of the fact that you are dealing with actual electronic components and electrical circuits require a return path as well. So there has to be a complete circuit that is complete and that is being built. So even though I show four wires over here, Actually, I also need a return path. It's entirely possible that I have one single return wire out here to close the connections for all four of these forward paths. That is possible. So it's not that I necessarily need four wires in the opposite direction as well. The second thing to keep in mind is a wire by itself is not directional. There is nothing fundamentally saying that a wire goes from left to right or right to left. It's a piece of metal. right? And the only sense in which something is directional is determined by what kind of circuit or what gate is driving it and where it is connected to. Is it connected to the input of some gate on this side? Okay. So, of course, if I want to transfer four bits of data, I would need four such wires. I can assume that I also need a clock signal because otherwise I don't really know when I am actually transferring data on this. When should this slave device sample? these different wires and figure out that there's actually valid data on them. And on top of that, I might also have some kind of control signals which actually say now I'm doing a write or now I'm doing a read, in which case the data might very well flow in the opposite direction. Right? We'll have to figure out electrically how to manage that so that the slave is now able to drive something onto the same set of wires. So you could have several parallel wires and you need some kind of clock synchronization the one good thing about it is in general it's going to be fast and why do I say fast because on every tick of the clock 
I'm going to transfer in this case four bits. So it's clearly a fairly efficient way of transferring data. Now, uh, an example of such parallel communication used to exist in the context of parallel printers, but I think nowadays you'll probably find it hard to even find a parallel printer interface. Right? Uh, so they are mostly obsolete at this point. It's going to be fairly uh, difficult to even find one active that works. But on the other hand, there are contexts in which people might use parallel communication. And mostly what happens over here is you create your own custom communication protocol by using the GPIO pins that are there. So let's say that if I have a microcontroller and it needs to communicate with another microcontroller and there are a bunch of GPIO pins between these two, I could connect them up and I could write programs on either side that basically say this is how you transfer data and on the other side this is how you receive it. I could do the same between a microcontroller and an FPGA or between two FPGAs or between an FPGA and a processing unit, a graphics unit or some other kind of custom peripheral that I want, right? The point I'm trying to make is in most cases, this turns out to be some at least slightly customized protocol. There aren't too many sort of standard networks that are built around parallel communication systems. Now, why is that? There are a few problems with uh, such parallel protocols. One of them is related to the concept of crosstalk and crosstalk once again is an electrical problem. What it's saying is, if there are two wires which are shown in orange over here, the very fact that there are two pieces of metal that are stretched out near each other across, let's say, a printed circuit board means that there is some kind of linkage between them, which could be, it's usually called a coupling. It could be a capacitive coupling or it could be an inductive coupling, right? In either case, what that actually means is that just because of either capacitive, because two metal plates separated by an insulator behave like a capacitance or because two metal plates can have in a magnetic field that sort of flows between them and therefore behave like an inductance. Either way, it is possible that a change in voltage on one side, which after all causes some flow of current through one wire, can be picked up by the other side and might end up causing at least a small glitch in the voltage on the other wire. Now, just imagine that there are multiple such wires on either side of this and they all glitch at the same or they all switch at the same time. It's quite possible that this one glitches to a point where it actually looks like it has transitioned from 0 to 1, even though it was not meant to. So crosstalk can be a very serious problem, especially at high data rates. Another one is what is called timing skew. And the point over here is that I have drawn two wires on a circuit board. And let's say that they are not exactly of the same length. Right? There is a finite speed of propagation of the signal through the wire, which is not quite the speed of light. It is actually because of the fact that you are putting it on a conductor, on an underlying circuit board and so on. It's a different speed that we are dealing with, but still extremely fast. And yet enough that the distance, just a small distance, maybe even a few centimeters could result in something which where the two signals that you have on the two wires end up a few nanoseconds apart or maybe even a fraction of a nanosecond apart that's enough to throw a communication protocol off, right? So crosstalk and say a timing skew are aspects of what is overall referred to as signal integrity. There are other aspects, which is how fast does the signal switch in the first place? Does it just switch cleanly from zero to one or does it overshoot and then come back or does it undershoot and take a long time to go? All of those are aspects of signal integrity. The point is when you have eight or more wires in parallel, or even four wires or even two wires for that matter, right? These signal integrity issues are much harder to deal with than if you did not have multiple such wires that you expect to be synchronized with each other. Now, apart from the signal integrity issues, there are also physical constraints. More wires are required for a certain amount of communication. And that also automatically means the distance over which you can reliably route these wires without having sort of problems in terms of the signal uh, quality becomes shorter. You can't route over long distances. And on top of that, there is also more chance of failure or the just signal quality degradation, right? Because what happens over here is that even one of the eight wires, let's say, breaks and you have suddenly lost information, right? And it's not as if the other seven wires can 
automatically reconfigure to take into account the fact that one of them has broken. You have to completely change your protocol to take into account the fact that one wire is broken or faulty. So in general, all of these lead to scalability issues. It is not easy to generalize this and build large communication systems out of parallel protocols like this.